Dr. Christopher Rapuano, the Chief of the Corning Service at Wilsey Hospital in Philadelphia. Hi, I'm uh, Clark Chang, uh, Director of Specialty Content Lenses at the uh, Corning Service at Wilsey Hospital. And we're very glad to have the opportunity to speak ev to everybody today about one of our favorite subjects, and that is the uh, some of our uh, contemporary keratoconus treatment management that we heavily utilize in our in our center and uh, just financial disclosure to start want everybody to know that we do some consulting work uh, both of us for Avidro and then rest of my uh, financial disclosure as you can see is up on the screen uh, and so I'm going to have Dr. Rapuano now lead us into the lecture with uh, one of the uh, one of the case that he has seen recently okay let's start off with just a typical case that any one of us could see Pretty much at any point in time. 16 year old boy, about two years ago, he noted um, his vision in the right eye was poor when looking through a microscope at school. That's often the way it is with one eyed vision loss, where people won't really notice until they end up covering one eye or just looking through one eye. That's a common presentation. Got the glasses, they helped, but he needed stronger glasses every four to six months. And now, at this point, the glasses are not really helping that much. There's no history of eye trauma, eye infections, or patching as a child, or any eye problems at all. So on examination, his vision without glasses was 2080 on the right, 2025 on the left. With glasses, he only corrects to 2060 on the right, corrects very nicely to 2020 on the left. His manifest is as seen there, minus five, plus three at 90, only gets him to 2025 on the right, and a little myopic astigmatism on the left gets him to 2020. So the exam is essentially normal in both eyes. Intraocular pressures are normal in both eyes as were dilated fundus exams. This is a pretty classic history. However, when we do our corneal topography, here we've got an atlas topography of the right eye. We've got the axial and tangential curvatures up top, the K readings on the bottom left, and then the ring images on the bottom right. And we can see pretty significant inferior steepening here. Um, in, uh, in this patient's right eye. When we look at the left eye, we also see some very mild inferior steepening, so there's also a little irregular astigmatism in the left eye in this patient. This patient has keratoconus. How do we define keratoconus? Well, it's really defined as central or paracentral posterior corneal protrusion, and that will tend to lead to, at least eventually, central or paracentral anterior corneal steepening which causes an irregular astigmatism it's associated with stromal corneal thinning. Keratoconus is almost always, some people believe always, but probably almost always bilateral, but it's often very asymmetric where one eye is much worse than the other. And another aspect of keratoconus is that there's no clinical inflammation. There may be some subclinical inflammation or microscopic, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but there's no clinical inflammation. There's no red eye. Here's just a nice classic kind of slip beam of a keratoconus patient. It's steep up at the top, uh, sorry, flat up at the top and steep centrally and then inferiorly. Here's a nice side view photo, which again shows this inferior steepening, kind of bowing inferiorly, kind of this very flat superior cornea. Now keratoconus affects between one in a thousand and one in 2000 people, at least in the classic definition but rather the prevalence may actually be somewhat higher. A recent study out of, I think, Norway showed it to be about one in about 375 to 400 people, but it really depends on the definition. Having said that, it's a fairly common condition. It's thought to be pretty sporadic, but there is a 10% kind of uh, uh, population with a family history of keratoconus. Whether that's a genetic component, there probably is somewhat of a genetic component, although it's multifactorial, or it could be some type of a cultural component too, where perhaps eye rubbing runs in a family or something like that. In general, the onset is in adolescence, although you can certainly see it in, you know, in, uh, in children who are as young as five or six years old, or even not uncommonly eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. But generally it's adolescence, it typically progresses through ages 20s to 30s, and then tends to stabilize. The cause of keratoconus in general is fairly unknown. We do know that eye rubbing um, most likely 
causes keratoconus, or at least makes keratoconus worse. Not exactly sure why that is. There's some theory that there's an oxidative stress. Um, there's cell metabolism that creates free radicals, which in normal corneas get neutralized and don't cause a problem. And there's some scientific evidence that keratoconus corneas lack this ability to um, get rid of those free radicals, allows the free radicals to damage the corneal collagen and causes weakening and protrusion and thinning. There are numerous associations um, in keratoconus, eye rubbing being by far the strongest association. And I ask all of my patients whether they rub their eyes and often they'll say no, but then I ask the person who's with them, their significant other or their parents, and they often say, oh yes, oh my God, yes, you do rub your eyes all the time. So we'll talk about it later, but the biggest piece of advice I give to patients and family members is the patient needs to stop rubbing their eyes. Atopic disease is also associated with keratoconus, and there may be an eye rubbing component. That's the link there. Down syndrome is also associated with keratoconus. Again, there may be an eye rubbing component associated there. Labor's, can, labor's congenital amaurosis, Ehlers Danlos, osteogenesis imperfecta, some other connective tissue disorders, connective tissue disorders may also be associated, although those are pretty rare. Some evidence that maybe contact lenses were associated with keratoconus, especially the hard PMMA lenses. Having said that, it's unclear whether they had the keratoconus and that's why they got their lenses. So it's unclear whether there's an association there. There are two very strong other associations that I examine all patients and ask patients about, which is floppy eyelid syndrome and sleep apnea. Um, so if patients do have symptoms of sleep apnea, I recommend that they see their primary care doctor um, for diagnosis and treatment, perhaps with a sleep study. The typical course of keratoconus, as I mentioned earlier, usually starts around ages you know, 10, 12, and diagnosed up to age 25, maybe a little bit older. And these patients note slowly progressive decrease in vision, usually in one eye more than the other eye. Again, initially correctable with new glasses, then their frequent glasses changes, and then later they're uncorrectable with glasses. At that point, often both eyes are symptomatic. Soft toric lenses may be helpful, um, but patients will often need a rigid gas perm lens to get their best vision, and we'll talk about treatments for that a little bit later on with Dr. Chang. What about the signs of keratoconus? Well, the early signs are inferior steepening on K readings, um, but nowadays we're typically we'll use corneal topography or corneal tomography. If you do retinoscopy, you get this irregular kind of water droplet reflex on retinoscopy. There's a Fleischer ring, which is an iron line in the epithelium at the base of the keratoconus elevated cone, which I'll show in a little bit. There's central, infracentral corneal thinning, um, and then there's thinning that's steepest at the apex of the cone. Also, votstria, which are stress lines in the posterior cornea, which I'll show in a little bit. So this is a photokeratoscope picture of keratoconus, just showing these concentric rings, and the rings are closer together inferiorly, meaning that they are steeper inferiorly than superiorly. Nowadays, we use corneal topography. As I showed earlier, here are the rings on the right side. A little hard to tell, but the computer easily tells that the rings are closer together inferiorly than, than superiorly. And the color-coded map, we see that the red